everyone. Uh, I'm going to present some of the results of my PhD research, uh, which examines how archivists manage and mitigate risks uh, when making material which is still protected by copyright available online. So I thought I'd start with a couple of quotes. Uh, most of the collections that I'm going to look at today date from the early to late 20th century. And I want to start with this quote from the UK Culture White Paper, which was published in March. Uh, the government wants to make the UK one of the leading countries for digitised public collections content. I thought I would pair this quote with the Universal Declaration on Archives. So we therefore undertake to work together in order that archives are made accessible to everyone while respecting the pertinent laws and the rights of individuals, creators, owners and users. I wanted to put these quotes together because I feel like archivists are being pulled in two directions. We want to make our collections accessible to everyone, and the government wants us to make more of that material available online. But even with recent changes to UK copyright law in 2014, the legislation falls far short of delivering the exceptions required to make collections available online at scale. And additionally, our own professional standards highlight the importance of respecting both the rights of creators and owners, um, but also those of users. And being pulled in these different directions could potentially lead to a very skewed digital public record. Of course, this is accepting the fact that there will always be other factors influencing the decision to make particular collections available instead of others. And that's not just uh, an issue of copyright. But copyright certainly contributes to the fact that material created in previous centuries has been digitized and made available, while the 20th century is strangely absent um, online. We know that the cost of rights clearance outstrips both the cost of digitization and the monetary value of most archive collections. And we also know that rights clearance processes are unsatisfactory. Um, so we've seen uh, from Kerry's presentation today, uh, rights holders cannot, cannot be found or they do not respond to permission requests. And the burden tends to be greater for archives because our collections are larger, they contain more orphan works, and because they're subject to absurdities like the 2039 rule. And as a result, archive institutions are very selective about what they digitize and make available online. So Jean Dryden's survey of Canadian archive institutions has shown that two thirds do not select items involving third party copyrights for inclusion in digitization projects. And we favor material, so we tend to develop digitization strategies based on ease of copyright compliance. So we pick uh, material where the depositor has assigned copyright to us, or where we know that our parent institution uh, has some claim on the copyright, or we look for material in the public domain. Although we do know, we, we do know that the public domain in the UK has been reduced uh, by the 2039 rule. So the projects today, uh, that I'm going to look at involve those institutions who have decided to digitise third party copyright material. And the first of those projects uh, are the Churchill Papers. Um, so these are some case study examples taken from my PhD. Uh, and these uh, are to illustrate the rights clearance process for different types of archive institutions and different types of collections. So the first is the Churchill Papers. Uh, they were purchased for the nation using Heritage Lottery Fund uh, funding, and they're held at Churchill College Archive Centre at Cambridge. Uh, they were originally mi microfilmed uh, between 2000 and 2005, and then they were digitised in 2010. And they were digitised by a commercial publisher each time. The archivist provided rights holder names from the catalogue, and they developed an appropriate rights clearance process, but the clearance itself was actually managed centrally by the publishers for both projects. And this was a comprehensive digitization project, so, so subject to sensitivity re review, uh, the entire collection was digitized. And rights holders were contacted uh, three times, either by letter or email, with follow-up attempts, and non-responders were advertised in the Times Literary Supplement. And I have the results of uh, both uh, rights clearance uh, attempts here. So there are two sets of results from two projects. The archivists identified roughly tw uh, 20,500 names in the catalogue and they attempted to trace all of those rights holders. They found roughly 12,500 addresses and letters were sent to them. Only a third of those contacted replied, which is very low. But 99% of those who responded said yes, which is a very positive result. 
Two thirds did not respond, and 39% of the rights holders could not be identified or contacted. Uh, so a huge amount of the collection is actually orphaned. And the second round of clearance in 2010 was much simpler because the previous clearance database had been kept and the process was completed a second time. And it's interesting to note that even though only five years have passed uh, between the two clearance projects, uh, but there is a 10% rise in orphan rights holders and the response rate falls by over 10%. There's also a slight rise in those refusing permission. And this may have something to do with the fact that the microfilm was only made available in university libraries, whereas in the second round, they were being made available online, although it was behind a paywall. The second uh, example I have uh, are the, uh, archi the archive of Blood Axe books. So the Blood Axe archive is an internationally significant resource for contemporary poetry, and it's held at University of Newcastle Special Collections and it includes files and material relating to the poetry that Blood Axe Books has published since 1978. The archive is to be made available for scholarly research through a standard web-based catalogue, but it's also, uh, it also benefits from a generous, open-ended and playful design to encourage greater creative interactions with it. So the screenshot I have here is a search function that's based on the shape of the text on a, on a page. The project team decided to complete some selective digitization to illustrate the visual catalog interface. So no full books or correspondence was digitized because of the rights implications. So in contrast to the Churchill papers, this is a very selective project. And given the age of the material and their relationship with the writers, the archivist decided to contact all of the identified rights holders. So it was a comprehensive clearance exercise. And the archivists have benefited from a close working relationship with Blood Axe, and they have been able to work with their rights manager throughout. So having identified 360 rights holders in the material selected uh, to make available online, the archivists were able to contact 91%, which is a very high rate, but not surprising given that they were working with the rights manager from Blood Axe. Again, the response rate at 53% isn't great. The lower permission rate of 72% isn't as high um, as we'll see with other projects, probably because of the commercial nature of the material and because it's contemporary. Um, so a lot of the poets featured uh, in the archive are still alive, they're still producing work, um, so they might not necessarily uh, want to make it available in another format. Non-responders are still a problem, 47% is practically half. Um, there are less orphan rights orders than, we, than we've seen previously, 9% is quite low. Um, and the archives have only made material available where permission has been granted, so non-responders material has not been made available. So a further example uh, is Glasgow School of Art Archives and Collections. They've been developing their first standalone online catalogue when I first went to speak to them. They hold visual collections and they want to be able to attach images to their catalogue entries, um, which is a simple way of making their catalogue more visual. And the ability to offer online access to their holdings has become important since the fire in May in 2014. Um, so while they didn't have the facilities to offer physical access to the collections, they really wanted to make as much um, of that material available online as possible. And again, it's not, it's not a mass digitization project li like Churchill, it's been quite selective. Um, so over the years, they've digitized a couple of collections, they've received funding for some small scale digitization, and they've also completed some piecemeal work uh, over, over the years. But again, like Blood Axe, it's, it's not comprehensive, it's very selective. And they have carried out a small amount of risk assessment, so they've decided to make any material pre-1939 uh, without clearing it, um, because they consider older material to be less of a risk. Um, but aside from this, they have attempted to contact all of the rights holders that they've identified. So the rights clearance is uh, comprehensive. So the archiv archivist surveyed the digitised material and found 263 rights holders that they wanted to contact. They found contact details for 195 and got in touch to ask for permission with follow-up requests where needed. 43% of those contacted responded, again, not a great response rate, but 100% of respondents granted permission, which again is very positive. Again, we have a significant amount of non-response at 57% of those contacted, and 26% of rights holders' material has turned out to be orphaned. 
Glasgow School of Art are still in the process of making these works available online and they are considering their options regarding uh, the Orphan Works licensing scheme um, because as they were going through this pro uh, process that's when the licensing scheme was just uh, getting started. They will make non-respondents uh, material available online um, but they're still uh, considering their options when it comes to Orphan Works. So in contrast uh, to the examples I've given so far, uh, this is uh, a project which took quite a different approach to rights clearance, uh, uh, and that's code breakers, make makers of modern genetics. Uh, so in 2013, I spent nine months working on a scoping study called Copyright and Risk, which looked at this project in more detail. The Wellcome Library are engaging in strategic digitisation designed to complement um, their research themes. So genetics was the first round and they've since digitised public health records and they're currently working on mental health records. And Code Breakers was really their first pilot mass digitisation project. The Wellcome Library has, uh, well, currently has over 5 million images available online and they aim to have 20 million available online by 2020. And Codebreakers, again, uh, was a comprehensive digitisation project similar to uh, Churchill. Um, and they also worked with five uh, partner archive institutions. So they ended up digitising digi over 20 collections uh, across their own institution and the other archives. And the collections are mainly composed of geneticist personal papers. Uh, so there's lots of correspondence series. And the Welcome knew that they were going to be dealing with thousands and thousands of third-party rights orders, quite similar to Churchill in that respect. But they decided that contacting all of them would be uh, impossible. So they developed a risk management strategy. And it consists of risk criteria to identify high-risk rights holders in the collections and a diligent search uh, methodology to locate them. Uh, all personal data is covered by the Wellcome Library uh, access to personal data policy and they have a takedown policy which covers everything posted on their website. Um, and in terms of diligent search sources, uh, they highlighted who's who, the watch file, Google, their own internal base databases and the third party archives that were involved. Um, Dictionary of National Biography, obituaries and Wikipedia as being the most useful sources during code breakers. And this is what the risk criteria look like. Um, so there's, a, we can debate the value judgments that these criteria make about rights holders, but there's an obvious focus on commercial material, uh, created for profit, published authors, the well-known, the elite, the established, uh, protective publishers or estates. And using these uh, risk criteria, um, they had a long list of rights holders uh, that they pulled from their own collections and from the partner archives, and they used these criteria to weed out rights holders, essentially. So through an iterative negotiated process, the list was eventually reduced to 160 rights holders. 134 were contacted with a 77% response rate, which is fairly reasonable, um, but is quite a concentrated uh, clearance effort. 98% of respondents granted permission, which again is very encouraging. But again, we can see the problem caused by orphan works and non-responding rights holders. Um, so essentially what the Welcome have decided to do is that they're going to make the orphan works uh, available online. And they did that. Um, this project was pre the orphan works legislation uh, coming in, but they've decided uh, that the way they approach code breakers is how they want to approach rights clearance in the future. So even though the orphan works um, schemes are there, the scheme is there, the licensing scheme is there, the exception is there, they're going to continue making material available on those basis and not use those um, not use the exception of the licensing scheme. They've also made the non-responders available, but they've done this in batches. So they've started uh, reclassifying them again into low, medium and high risk. And those are being made available in tranches based on how old the material is. So the older material is made available first. Uh, and the, um, the most recent uh, material has uh, just been made available in the last year mm -hmm. or so. So in addition to uh, the case studies, I've also, I also have some survey results which I thought, you, uh, thought you might find interesting. These figures are taken from a survey of the UK archive sector on copyright and digitisation that I conducted as part of my PhD research in late 2014. And the survey received 121 responses. 
And this gives an idea of the type of archive services that responded, and these classifications are based on the National Register of Archives. So one of the questions I asked was, had the, had the archive services engaged in project-led digitization, which I differentiated from digitization for, for preservation purposes or for fulfilling individual copy order requests? Um, and this resu result shows that 62% of respondent institutions have engaged in project-led digitization. Um, but there is still a substantial number of institutions who haven't yet engaged in this kind of digitization, so that's 33%. And in answer to the, the second question, um, did the document selected for digitisation include public domain or copyright expired works, um, works where the copyright is owned by a parent institution or a depositor and works where the copyright is owned by a thir third party? Um, so 69 out of 121 institutions um, responded to this uh, question, so not the entire uh, survey population actually responded to it. But we can see that from this that public domain and depositor copyright works are still the most popular, or parent copyright works are still the most popular, with 70 and 68% respectively. Um, but 34 institutions uh, did say that they had digitised some third-party copyright material in the past, which I think is quite an interesting result. I also thought it would be interesting to look at a little more detail at how rights holders feel about being contacted for permission to digitise. So even though only a small proportion of the respondents to the survey had actually engaged in rights clearance of third party copyright material, i.e. 34 institutions, they reported that rights holders that they had contacted were overwhelmingly positive about digitization. They wanted formal acknowledgement in many cases and quite a few were actually unaware that they held rights in the material selected for digitization. Um, and a very small number uh, wanted to be included in events and outreach surrounding the project in question. Another element of digitisation I thought would be interesting to look at in more detail is how often archive services receive complaints and takedown requests from rights holders relating to third party copyright material that they've made available online. So only 5% of respondents, i.e. six institutions, reported that they had received a complaint or takedown request. And we can see here that most of them are resolved simply by taking the material down from the website without paying compensation. Um, although compensation has been paid in a very small number of uh, cases. None of those complaints or takedown requests resulted in litigation. And in relation to the Codebreakers project, all of the archivists involved said that damaging the reputations as trusted repositories was the main risk associated with taking part in the project. Um, they weren't worried about being sued, essentially. And every case study interview I've conducted since the Welcome project um, reputation has always been mentioned as the main risk factor. Um, so, yeah, no one's worried about being sued, uh, but they are concerned um, that they'll get, you know, a spate of takedown requests or they'll get lots of complaints from rights holders and that could damage their reputations. But I think what we can see from the survey is that that's actually quite rare. So, just to uh, finish up with some lessons learned. Uh, Respondents tend to grant permission if uh, you can get a hold of them. Uh, the exception to this is blood axe, uh, but I think that can be explained by the nature and age of the material. So it's contemporary material, uh, still living writers, um, and they probably have a commercial interest in some of this material, uh, so I'd expect a lower permission rate for that. The other lesson is that often rights holders grant permission without seeking a fee. Um, there have been instances in the survey and some of the case studies where rights holders have requested license fees, um, but this really doesn't appear to happen very often, and such, all, such offers uh, can always be negotiated. Rights holders' main concerns about granting permission for use of archive material often don't involve copyright per se, although copyright uh, might be used as a reason. Um, they're actually often concerned about the content and sensitivity of the material. Um, and artists and writers can feel uncomfortable about their early work being made available, especially if their practice has evolved significantly over the years. And writers can also feel uncomfortable about unpublished drafts of the work being made available. 
So I think there's ways of um, you know, thinking about how you communicate with particular types of rights holders and how you can make them feel comfortable with the digitisation that you want to do. And other lessons learned from the case studies include the importance of effective communication. Um, so articulating your aims for the project to rights holders, emphasising when the project is non-commercial and especially telling the rights holder exactly what material you want permission for and what you intend to do with it. And there are two reasons for this. I know it sounds really obvious, um, but you'd be surprised at the number of projects that trip up over um, this issue. It's mainly because rights holders are often surprised to be contacted, and if you don't describe the material in detail, you'll get lots of follow-up requests. Um, and also, in order to uh, seek permission and obtain a license, uh, you need to be clear about uh, the use that will be made uh, of the material that you're making available online. Many of the archivists I've spoken to feel that there are positives to the overall rights clearance process given the effort involved. So it's a chance to get back in touch with depositors and some have become involved in outreach and fundraising as a result of contact. Asking users or depositors for information about collections can lead to increased engagement and advertising the fact that you're looking for rights holders in a collection can boost external coverage of projects. And particularly, acting as a go-between for users and depositors when it isn't possible to have copyright assigned to the archive at the point of deposit is recognised as a good way of establishing and building trust with depositors, which can eventually lead to assignment of copyright further down the line. Okay. Um, I hope you found the examples I've presented useful. The case studies and survey results will be published in due course. If you're considering digitising third-party copyright material, I think it's really important to have a range of examples and approaches to draw from so that you can select and tailor the rights clearance process that's best suited to your institution, collection and budget, and which strikes the right balance between respect for the law and respect for rights holders, but also meets some of the aims for universal access set out by the International Council on Archives, amongst others. I thought I'd finish with some factors to consider before you start a project that includes material which is third-party copyright. These risk factors have cropped up again and again during the case studies, but they should always be balanced against the benefits of making the material available online in the first place, whether that's for community engagement, research and teaching, working with schools, or crowdsourcing uh, description and transcription and things like that. So you can think about the age of the material, um, the purpose it was originally created for, the type of rights holder uh, that's re uh, presented in the material, whether you're engaging in comprehensive or selective digitization, and whether that will lead to comprehensive or selective rights clearance. Um, you can think about the appropriate resources for diligent search and how you might try to put uh, limits on that process. The extent of the catalogue is really important. Um, so if you only have a box list compared to you, like an item level description, um, that's going to affect uh, your audit of the collection before you start. And also thinking about the intended access, so whether it's going to be behind a paywall, whether the user has to register to use uh, the website, whether it's being made available on social media, and whether you allow commercial or non-commercial reuse. I think it's important to have relevant policies and the mission statement on this, and also to get senior management and in-house legal teams on site. So to finish, I just thought, um, I'd say that the, the archive sector is often perceived as risk averse, and I think in many ways it is. But I'm very optimistic um, that this can change in the future um, slowly but surely. So, thank you.